second uh, talk I have for you is called Jim Crow Returns, with a question mark, Mass Incarceration in America. Uh, this is quite controversial, and, and what I'd like to emphasize is that much of what I'm going to do is provide you with an awful lot of statistical information uh, and hopefully some frameworks for thinking about it and perhaps with a few questions uh, rather than trying to uh, answer what may be the greatest dilemma that faces this country. So when Alexis de Tocqueville and Gustave de Beaumont traveled to the United States from France in 1831, they did so with the primary purpose of examining the prison systems of the New Republic. The nation's prisons were considered the most progressive on earth and the emerging emphasis on rehabilitation over punishment in the US was considered their most progressive feature. De Tocqueville and Beaumont's visit began with the premise that a nation's treatment of its incarcerated social transgressors is a strong measure of the soundness of its democratic structures and promise. The very well-known work that resulted from their visit is Tocqueville's Democracy in America, right, two volumes, 1835 and 1840 one of the most insightful studies of the nation's political and social characteristics. The less familiar work is their co-authored study, The U.S. Penitentiary System and Its Application in France, two volumes published in 1833. And that work proved influential among those seeking prison reform in Europe. Tocqueville and Beaumont focused much of their attention on the efforts of the Quakers in Philadelphia. And the Quakers believed that the complete rehabilitation of most prisoners was an eminently achievable goal. The goal of rehabilitation was to be achieved, and here our modern sensibilities may be rather shocked, through solitary confinement, which would, so the theory went, lead to extreme anxiety, which in turn would lead prisoners to welcome visits from and conversations with priests and other model citizens. The isolation and anxiety combined, or better contrasted, with the guidance of such role models would lead prisoners to renounce their crimes and repent, reform their habits, instincts, and ideas, and become model citizens themselves. Now, by way of contrast, Tocqueville and Beaumont were deeply shocked by the prisons of the South, where chaining of prisoners and administering of brutal physical punishment seemed to be the norm, and where any notions of rehabilitation seemed absent. Their imprisonment was about punishment, not reform. They were also shocked by the principle of total isolation that characterized carceral policy in the North, even among the Quakers. And Tocqueville and Beaumont proposed a much more diluted model, marked by isolation at night and contact with fellow prisoners during the day, while on work details. But Tocqueville and Beaumont went further still in their reform ideology. They favored rehabilitation not just for practical reasons, but because they believed society's more unfortunate members, the poor and dispossessed, were more likely to commit crimes in the first place, and they did so largely out of necessity. Deviancy could be correlated with social conditions, they said. Tocqueville and Beaumont argued that the most productive way to combat crime was to address the social conditions that made crime a necessity. Improving social conditions would reduce crime, and rehabilitating criminals was eminently logical, given that they were themselves, in no small degree, victims of circumstances. Progressive stuff. Let's step forward in time nearly two centuries to today, where there's not much discussion of rehabilitation of prisoners in the US carceral system, what would Tocqueville and Beaumont have made of mass incarceration in early 21st century America? Let's begin with the contours of the landscape. We'll place them into a top 10 list of interesting and disturbing dimensions of the American carceral state, since the nation is most definitely and conspicuously number one in the world in this regard. Now I draw here on what is arguably the most important article by an American historian published since the beginning of the new millennium, Heather Ann Thompson's Why Mass Incarceration Matters, Rethinking Crisis, Decline, and Transformation 
in post-war American history, published in the Journal of American History in December 2010. So our first category, the US and the world. In 2008, the United States rate of incarceration was 756 per 100,000, which placed it well ahead of every other industrialized democracy in the world. England and Wales incarcerated 153 per 100,000 uh, in that year. Australia, the former British penal colony, 129 per 100,000. Canada, 116. France, 96. Germany, 89. Ireland, a mere 44. That figure of 756 per 100,000 also places the US ahead of every nation whose democratic virtues we regularly call into question. Russia, 629. Cuba, 531, Iran, 222, Mexico, 207, China, 119. China, by the way, doesn't include its political prisoners in its incarceration statistics, but add a million political prisoners into the category, and China still doesn't come close to matching the US per capita rate of incarceration. Europe as a whole, Russia not included, incarcerates about one person for every six incarcerated in the US. In fact, to give you a fuller sense of U.S. mass incarceration in global context, the U.S. is home to approximately 5% of the world's population and to 25% of its prisoners. The U.S. prison population increased 700% from 1970 to 2005. 2010 saw a 0.3% decline, the first decline in the US prison population since 1972. Second category, the US and its states and its regions. In 2008, the total US correctional population numbered about 7.3 million. 0 0.8 million in jail, about 0 0.8 million on parole, 1.5 million in prison, and 4.3 million on probation. The nation's most avid incarcerators at the state level are Louisiana, Alaska, Mississippi, Texas, Arizona, Alabama, and Oklahoma. In 2008, almost 1%, 0.867 to be precise, almost 1% of Louisiana's population was in prison, and that does not include those in jail or on parole or on probation. Harsh sentencing for marijuana possession helps explain Louisiana's prison preeminence. The South incarcerates its citizens at nearly twice the rate of the Northeast. The Midwest and the West fall between the two extremes of the South and the Northeast. Third category, U.S. mass incarceration and race. 2006 U.S. Bureau of Justice figures inform us that 4.8 percent of black men were in prison compared with uh, 2.7% uh, of Hispanic men and 0.7% of white men. One in nine African American males between the age of 20 and 29 was in prison. 2013 figures suggest that Oklahoma trails only Wisconsin in the incarceration of black men aged 18 to 64. So Wisconsin, 12.8% of black men in that age range were in prison. Oklahoma, 9.7%. The other states that incarcerate African Americans at a particularly high rate are Iowa, Pennsylvania, California, Indiana, Louisiana, of course, makes most of the lists, Texas, Kansas, and Colorado. A fourth category, mass incarceration and gender. Men make up about 90% of the prison uh, and local jail population, and their rate of imprisonment is 14 times that of women. The number of women in state and federal prisons, though, grew steadily from the early 1990s up to 2007, when it leveled off at about 115,000. The South incarcerates women at nearly three times the rate of the Northeast. Women are the fastest growing demographic in U.S. prisons, and Oklahoma uh, does have the highest rate per capita of female incarceration in the country, and that has been the case for most of the last decade and a half. There are currently about two and a half thousand incarcerated women in the state of Oklahoma. And Oklahoma's female incarceration rate of approximately 69 per 100,000 in 2009 was about twice the national average. A fifth category, well, mass incarceration and crime. The crime rate, 
by just about any measure, has been going down steadily since the beginning of the 1990s, for nearly a quarter of a century. Yet the rate of incarceration went up steadily until about 2010. But does the rising incarceration rate explain the falling crime rate? Or is the rising incarceration rate even more difficult to justify in light of the declining crime rate? Now, the answer to that question will depend upon one's ideological convictions. A sixth category, U.S. and mass incarceration historically considered. This is a short category, but a shocking one. In the 35 years leading up to and including the tumultuous 1960s, the number of Americans incarcerated in federal and state prisons had increased by 52,249 people. So the 35 years leading up to and including the 1960s, the number of Americans incarcerated in federal and state prisons increased by just over 52,000. In the subsequent 35 years since the 1960s, that group increased by 1,266,243. Seventh category, the United States and changing conceptions of crime and punishment. The first mandatory minimum sentencing bill at the federal level was passed in 1976. By 2000, 33 states had abolished limited parole, 24 had introduced three strikes laws, and 19 states allowed minors to be sentenced to life without possibility of parole. And speaking of changing notions of what to police, by the early 2000s, the school district of New York City had the 10th largest police force in the country with 4,625 personnel. An eighth category, mass incarceration and urban crisis. By the end of the 20th century, federal and state inmates were parents to almost 1.5 million children under the age of 18. By 2008, the figure was over 1.7 million children. One such child in particular haunted Nell Bernstein, a journalist who conducted detailed interviews about the effects of parental incarceration in the 1990s. And I'll quote, I asked him how he came to be in foster care. He told me that one day the police came to his house and took his mother, he never found out why, and left him at nine years old alone with a baby brother. This kid spent two weeks alone giving his brother a bottle, changing his brother's diaper, and he remembered that every day his mother used to take them out for a walk. So every day he got out the stroller and took his brother down the street in the stroller. And finally, after two weeks of this, somebody noticed and made a phone call. By 2000, one in 10 children in the United States had one or more parent under correctional supervision, a disproportionate number of them in urban centers. Heather Ann Thompson also reminds us that HIV AIDS rates are five times higher in the prison population than the general population. Prisoners when released return in disproportionate numbers to urban areas and the public health ramifications of mass incarceration are thus enormous. Our ninth category, mass incarceration and the decline of unionized labor. Beginning in the 1970s, Thompson reminds us, the same business groups that were pushing anti-union agendas were also pressing for the lifting of restrictions on prison labor. In 1985, Supreme Court Justice Warren Burger expressed his desire to turn prisons into factories with fences. By 2000, 36 states had granted private employers full access to prison labor. Over 80,000 inmates were working in government and private industry jobs for 25 cents to $7 an hour. Low wages, no sick days, no worker compensation, few workplace safety regulations, which means enormously low overhead for companies. The privatization of the prison industry in America has accelerated this trend. Corrections Corporation of America is one of 18 for-profit prison building and management companies in the United States. From 1852 to 1964, California built 12 prisons. 
Since 1984, the state has built at least 23 more. And our tenth category, U.S. mass incarceration and party politics. Now, this is not a simple Democratic-Republican Party dichotomy. In 1968, it was the Lyndon Johnson administration that pushed the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act. Getting tough on crime became a Democratic Party priority and an election strategy, just as it was for the Republican Party. And returning to the earlier talk this morning, just as Democratic politicians had to get tough on the Cold War, had to become Cold Warriors in response to Republican criticism, so Democratic politicians got more tough on crime in response to Republican charges that Democrats were weak on crime. The famous California Three Strikes Law passed via referendum in 1993 with 72% of the vote after Richard Allen Davis's kidnapping and the murder of Polly Klass. In 1994, it was Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, who in the 1992 campaign had called for 100,000 more police on the streets. Bill Clinton, who called for a national three strikes law. It passed Congress and became law in 1995. The consequence of the efforts of both parties to get tougher on crime than each other were probably not foreseen by the strategists of either party. At least one hopes they were not. But an eerie historical parallel starts to develop. Between 1865 and 1900, the same period that southern prisons became filled with African Americans, 19 states adopted or amended laws restricting the voting rights of criminal offenders. This is in the South in the decades after the Civil War. Regarding African American disenfranchisement, in the 1974 Richardson v. Ramirez case, the Supreme Court points to, f to uh, the 14th Amendment stipulation that no one's right to vote could be revoked except for participation in rebellion or other crime. The irony of this is that the 14th Amendment stipulation is used to disenfranchise felons and former felons. You're thinking, well, how big? A factor can that be in elections? Well, by 2008, 1.8 million African Americans had been bar barred from voting. Moreover, the incarcerated are counted as part of the electorate in the places they are housed, which increases the electoral clout of largely white rural areas, even though, of course, those inmates cannot vote, and decreases the electoral weight of urban areas. Thompson compares this to the three-fifths rule for representation in the House of Representatives in the South prior to the Civil War. This process has benefited in measurable ways the Republican Party and handicapped the Democratic Party in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. So, in conclusion, as Heather Ann Thompson makes very clear in her article, mass incarceration matters. As a phenomenon, it's contributed to the urban crisis in the United States. To offer an example, in Detroit, the nation's bankrupted and perhaps irreparably blighted example of urban decay, 41% of all prisoners released to Wayne County returned to a total of just eight zip codes, all in absolutely devastated parts of the city. Mass incarceration does not just reflect the urban problems the nation faces, it contributes to, it, to them in significant and measurable ways. Mass incarceration may also help account for the decline of organized labor over the last four decades. In addition, some scholars of mass incarceration claim that their evidence demonstrates that the Republican Party won elections at the state level and as a consequence actually won national elections because of the scale of mass incarceration of African Americans who vote overwhelmingly, generally about 90% Democratic. But let me conclude with the biggest claim of all, one made by Michelle Alexander in her book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness, published in 2010. That claim uh, is a complicated one, but it goes something like this. Following the formal end of slavery with the 13th Amendment in 1865 and the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments ratified in 1868 and 1870 respectively, which gave the newly freed slaves civil rights 
and gave freedmen voting rights, following those constitutional changes, a systematic process of incarceration of African Americans began to unfold in the late 19th century. Douglas Blackman charts this process in his shocking Pulitzer Prize winning book and public television series, Slavery by Another Name, The Reenslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to World War II. Alexander argues that the mass incarcer incarceration of African Americans in the post-civil rights era, after the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, parallels the mass incarceration of African Americans after emancipation a century earlier and amounts to a systematic effort on the part of the American state and its majority culture to respond to the freedoms gained through the civil rights movement. In short, she contends that the two greatest moments of the black freedom struggle in American history were both met by a massive backlash of mass incarceration, one supported by changes in the law and irony of ironies in the case of the post-civil rights era mass incarceration by the 14th Amendment itself, a constitutional change designed to guarantee African-American citizenship rights but one which then takes away uh, 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 voting rights. The argument is a controversial one, and the scholarship on mass incarceration, while massive in volume, is still developing and currently probably offers more questions than answers. But one two-part question that surely springs to mind is, what on earth would Alexis de Tocqueville and Gustave de Beaumont, de Beaumont have thought of a nation whose prisons currently account for 25% of the incarcerated people on earth? And would the former of the two, de Tocqueville, have been able to bring himself to write a book such as Democracy in America, had a parallel situation existed in the nation's prison system in the 1830s? Thanks so much for listening. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.